Hey everybody, welcome. Um, today is Friday, April 16th. This is Michael Bracey with the Music Policy Forum and I am thrilled to welcome you all to this week's edition of Music Policy Forum Live, our weekly conversation program where we explore all the complicated issues at the intersection of policy and industry and nonprofit leadership and research and all the things that we are all collectively trying to do to build stronger, more resilient and more equitable music ecosystems. Um, as always, we just are so appreciative of you spending some of your Friday with us. We know that uh, we all have a tremendous amount of demands on our time and attention and the fact that uh, all y'all come and hang out with us on Fridays means a lot to us. A um, little bit of housekeeping before we get into the program. Uh, we've got some great topics and guests today. Uh, we're really excited to get into um, looking at the Boise music community, looking at some cultural leaders in, in Albuquerque, uh, how they've been navigating this uh, past, uh, the complications of the past year and, and, and looking ahead to the future. Um, before that, uh, and before we get into our kind of our news roundup, I want to um, just uh, go over again some, some basic ground rules for those of you who haven't been with us before. Um, if you are so inclined, don't feel obligated. If you're so inclined, feel free to put your name and, and where you're joining us from uh, in the chat. So it's great to get a sense of who's with us and, and where they're joining from. Um, throughout the uh, session, if you have questions, um, just put them into the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can throughout the day. And as always, this program is being recorded and will be part of our Music Policy Forum archive. Uh, Alex, our awesome producer, can put the link to the archive in the chat uh, later in the program. So with that, what a week, right? What a year, what a, what a 18 month, this is, has really been a, a journey. Um, again, if you're watching this program, you probably are following very carefully what's happening here in Washington um, in terms of the uh, stops and starts and, and uh, you know stops that we're still going through in terms of the Small Business Administration preparing to open up the portal to accept applications for the Shuttered Venue Operator Grants. There are rumors, which we all should take with a big old grain of salt that that may open next week, but um, we're all eagerly waiting uh, that portal to, to, to open and, and, and obviously for that process to work. And, you know, I think all of us uh, have a great deal of empathy for the public servants at SBA that are working really, really hard to try to make this thing uh, succeed because this program needs to work. It needs to work well. It needs to work quickly. Um, and certainly, um, you know, there's, there's no accusations of sabotage or anything like that. This is just a really hard thing to build. So, Looking at the SBA portal, we're waiting for guidance from the Department of Treasury about state and local government and how uh, the cities and counties can be spending out some of their recovery dollars. Uh, we know that this week, I believe on Tuesday, King County, Washington is gonna be taking up uh, County Executive Constantine's proposal to spend a significant amount of money on the cultural economy recovery, which we're excited to see where that goes. There's just a lot of stuff happening. And, you know, in, in the midst of a lot of stuff happening, sometimes it's easy to, you know, kind of get, I don't know, like confused. Like you hear things and, and, and you're not really sure, like, is this really happening? I mean, 14 months ago, if you told me that Mick Jagger was going to do a song with Dave Grohl and it was going to be called Easy Sleazy and the proceeds would go in part to the music venue trust and then to do this through the auctioning a NFT. I mean, what, what is happening out here? I, I asked Mark David, I was like, Mark, you know, what, what, what does this mean? I mean, how, I, you know, how do you respond to something like this happening? I mean, Mick Jagger and Dave Grohl raising money for your organization through something called an NFT. And Mark emailed, he said, I'm still not sure I understand what it is, but I'm glad it's happening. If COVID has taught us two things, it's that one, there's something new to be learned every day and two, artists really do care about the grassroots and are prepared to do something to help us. And Mark says he's carrying both those things forward with him after COVID, which I think is, is a really good way to, to think about this stuff. And, and, and I think it's, you know, we, we all know things are happening. I mean, we've, we've used this image of the roller coaster for the last, you know, last year and we're getting to, 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 to the top. And I don't know if we're at this part or this part or this part, but things are about to start happening incredibly quickly. I mean, just catching up with some of our musician friends that we've had on the program over the last year. Um, Dessa has continued with her IDES project every on the 15th of each month. She's releasing a new single and video. Uh, this week's single came out yesterday. It's called Terry Gross. She's uh, Dessa's leaning into her NPR uh, fan base, which uh, we all appreciate. 
Uh, our friend Tao from Tao and the Kadam Stay Down has actually started a Substack, which is a really interesting newsletter and, and, and kind of publishing platform. Her Substack is kind of tracking the experience and the process that she's going through and writing and recording her new album. Uh, and she has uh, announced uh, tour dates starting in uh, September. Uh, our friend Barty Strange, similarly, he's hitting the road. He'll be on the road starting in September. Uh, our friend Mark O'Shea in Cleveland uh, is, is part of the Wonderstruck Festival in, in Cleveland, which uh, announced this week. Uh, our friends at 930 Club are booking shows. So this is, this is happening and it's happening in a really tangible and uh, meaningful and a fast way. So we've got a, a lot to be, uh, a lot to be looking forward uh, forward to the rest of the summer. Uh, certainly, as we move into the fall, it's it, it's, it's going to be it's going to be a lot, and um, and we're glad that you're with us, and we're glad that we're doing this as a community, and we're learning from each other, and and we're all just trying to to kind of do what we can to not only navigate these difficult times, but to share ideas and strategies and and best practices, and and try to not reinvent the wheel where it's uh, sometimes impossible to reinvent that wheel. So. With that, um, I am excited to move into our next stage. And Alex, we've got someone in the audience who I'd, I'd like to bring in here just real quick. Um, Can we bring uh, Mr. Mr. Elliot in to uh, give us a hand here? Because we, uh, our first guest is, is Eric Gilbert. Many of you know Eric as a, as a community leader and, and a big part of the Tree Fort Music Festival and, and uh, a lot of different pieces of this. And, I have not had the opportunity to to attend Tree Fort, but I first heard of it, I think, through through Jesse Elliott. And, and Jesse, thank you for for popping in here, kind of unannounced. But I wanted you to, to join at the beginning because I, I'm pretty sure I heard from you that I don't know that you say favorite. I don't know that you play favorites. You're not a favorite kind of guy, but you 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 bent my ear a couple of years ago about what a special experience the the Tree Fort Festival is. And and I would just love for you to share with us a little bit about why Tree Fort is so special. And then we're going to show a little bit of video that will, will give people a, a sense of that as well. So Jesse, thanks for popping in. Oh, I wish the video could go first. That would seem the more, uh, you know, the best. Don't order. micromanage right. my, my, I'm happy my, to be here. <laughs> thanks for the invitation, Michael. Uh, yeah, I think if, if nothing else, um, as all of us who know Eric uh, know, he is amongst the humblest human beings in the universe. And so I think, uh, Gracie wanted me to uh, get up and shout some praises for uh, what what truly is one of my favorite experiences of my entire life. Um, uh, I don't use favorite a lot, uh, especially in this kind of crowd, because there's a lot of cool people doing a lot of cool shit all over this Zoom room. I see all of you. Uh, but Tree, Tree Fort, I think, definitely, you know, redefined uh, music festivals for me, maybe in ways that seem simple now or, or even obvious because more and more places are doing them but uh, uh it sort of brought it back to that it's this beautiful mix between kind of like the boutique artistry of pickathon for those of you up in the northwest and then kind of the the street festival type thing which i think those of us in colorado back in the day knew as the underground music showcase but of course there's the more famous uh, south by southwest and sort of all of its variants um and then i think tree fort for me what what grabbed my attention when we first started playing it and then just going and then getting old and so just being on panels and not playing it uh, which is honestly my favorite phase of life so far is the being old and on panels <laughs> on stage part uh but what grabbed me was like the truly multidisciplinary nature and it wasn't multidisciplinary in a showy or a in your face sort of way it was it's sort of multidisciplinary in the way that like everyday life is multidisciplinary and that we have all of these forts that these yoga forts and these food forts and these music forts and that are kind of that are kind of attached and i think um in my mind i always see tree fort even though this is not an actual physical manifestation as this kind of like endless rube goldberg mc escher like a fort upon a fort within a fort behind a fort, which is, isn't that like the ultimate dream when we get into creative acts, like all of us are just doing these projects that are these kind of uh, ever expanding uh, fort on fort on fort kind of things. So I hope that's not too abstract. I mean, the, the, that the is perfect. No, it's just to go there. And I think the video is gonna, is gonna do it all the justice that I can't, but. Um, that's awesome. Jesse, thank you for, for popping in. It's exactly what we're hoping anytime. for, Alex. Yeah, let's roll that video and then we'll, we'll embarrass Eric a little bit and then we'll bring him in and, and make him blush.
go to a festival, huh? I'm ready. I am so ready. Eric, um, thank you for joining us. You pumped? You ready? Yeah. Also, thanks. I didn't know my uh, hype man was going to be here, but much appreciated, Mr. Elliot. That was that was great. <laughs> I use that introduction everywhere I go because I can't even explain tree, tree fort as well as he did. So. <laughs> no, he's been he's been bending my ear about it for years. So I'm I'm glad to thanks Jesse for for popping in and you know there's some let's let's talk a little bit about some of the stuff. I mean Jesse talked about it was reflecting the video a little bit, but talk a little bit about kind of the ethos behind tree fort and. Talk about the fort concept because it's it's pretty. I think it's interesting. I don't need to say it's unique. It's interesting. So how does how does this work? Yeah. I, first, I just want to say thanks thanks Michael and to the Music Policy Forum for having me. Um, I also just want to say it was it was a little intense just watching that video. Is that it was that literally was the last festival we did, which was over two years ago now, which is kind of crazy. And uh, I know time has been warped for all of us, but it was just a a, a reminder of that, and it was fun to look at. I look forward to that happening again. Um, so the fort concept, I mean, so tree, tree, tree fort was really, you know, it was literally built, you know, you know, as a, as a, as a fort out here in Boise, Idaho on what I like to call like the, uh, the, uh, um, the frontier of the, uh, the cultural frontier, you know, we're the most isolated metro metropolitan area in the lower 48 states. And, and um, but it is on touring routes, and so similar to the early forts that was booked that, that when they were out here in the in the pioneer days, is there people need need to stop in this area. But there was a lot of un, there, a lot of people didn't know a lot of the independent um, bands rolling through, and I come out of the independent touring circuit as well. And so you know it was really I, I spent a lot of time at the underground music showcase in in Denver, played South by Southwest, CMJ in New York City, Music Fest Northwest in Portland, and so. As a person in a band, I love that model of festival mostly because it was when all of us band people were all in the same place at the same time, and we got to actually hang out with each other and see each other play. But it was such a cool way to build community. Like the touring community is a community of its own, and then Boise is has its own great community. So it was really founded from like an artist lens, right? Like really like, okay, what's a festival? How how can we build a festival that a helps the local community, helps introduce the touring traffic to Boise better and makes it a better stop for them. And also is built in a way that us artists would really like to experience it. And so I, I use that as, so anyways, it started in 2012 now. And then what happened with that is that model sort of other people in the community and in other silos, like the literary community. I mean, the first community to reach out to us was the beer community and wanted to do an ale fort. And that was a pretty natural fit. And then, um, so it's a tasting, a, a beer tasting event happened the first year. The following year, then we started adding things like story for it, which, but I think the model of it and kind of what Jesse touched on briefly was that people within that silo, within the literary community came to, came to us with an interest in modeling it, like, you know, basically a, a festival for and by the artists that are already within that vein. And so, and then, so we started adding, now there's a yoga fort, a skate fort, a food fort, ale fort, the music talks thing, there's, um, uh, hack fort, film fort, art fort, there's a lot of forts. But point being is they're all built by pe people that are active within those communities. So it wasn't a very, it wasn't a top down design by any means. In fact, it wasn't even part of the initial design of the festival. We just reacted to the interest of the community. And and I think it is what makes Tree Fort so special is it is like J Jesse more articulately was able to articulate. There's just all this natural collaboration that comes out of it. And it it's cool how that then translates to the year round approach in the community and different people in different um, veins of the creative community uh, realizing there's a lot of strength in working to uh, to uh, gather with each other and finding where those bridges are. So anyway, so there's a bunch of forts now and and yeah, that's kind of, does that answer your question? No, 100%. And, and just talking about Boise, just kind of the geography for those who have not had a, a chance to be out in that neck of the woods. What, what is the kind of the closest, I mean, if you're thinking about touring routes, what, what kind of drives we're looking at, like just kind of help us pinpoint Boise, you know, ge ge ah, geographically uh, up in that part of the world. Not to overly reference Jesse Elliott, but because last time I saw him speak, he talked about where he is being the, I think the Northwest of the South. We're kind of the Southeast of the Northwest. So, um, cause we are technically <laughs> in the, and that kind of has some analogies that kind of fit in a few different ways. But we're, you know, uh, as far as we're on I-84, which so really if you're coming from Den Denver and take go through Salt Lake, 
and stay south of Montana, you have to drive through us. And so a lot of the touring routes will and then once you head west from, from us, you can either go to Seattle or Portland. And so we're kind of on that route. Um, we are technically in, in the Northwest and, um, but we are very much in the inner mountain West. So for those that haven't been here, we're kind of like a smaller Den Denver located where Boulder is because <laughs> we're right on the base of the mountain. So, yeah. And is it like eight hours to Seattle? Oh yeah. So it's about nine hours to Seattle, about five and a half to Portland, about five and a half to Salt Lake city um about six or so to missoula yeah about eight or nine to reno and uh, 11 to los angeles 11 and a half so that's that that's so funny the um someone from washington dc that's a lot of hours right like, yeah that's that, that's a that's a lot of uh, dc boston trips um the uh so how would, what has been the balance in terms of, so Tree Fort obviously started, you know, organically, people in the community, for the community, by the community, but it has obviously morphed and grown into something which now brings in a lot of people to Boise, people travel for it, it's a destination thing. How has that sort of fit into the vision of what you are trying to do? And is there a balance, is there a tension there? Is there, or is it, like, do you feel like it's it's on the right track? You feel comfortable with sort of the national international profile growing over time? Is it getting too big? Uh, Boise? No. Yeah. Tree, Fort. Tree Fort. So Tree Fort, we've managed the growth pretty well. It's been a pretty steady growth. And there is about 35% of our pass holders come from out of state. So we are one of the biggest. Um, it's definitely the, the, the largest like press event, the largest beer event, stuff that happens in Idaho every year. So um, Boise's profile has raised a lot in the last 10 years. I do think Treefort has played a role in that both. So I take it's positive, but also as Boise's profile has risen, you know, we're, we're facing a lot of the growth issues, a lot of other places. So there's an interesting tension there. You know, you're trying to build a community that has import and exportability, but also sustainability locally. And, and so I think, you know, but we're because of the nature of how we intersect both with being in the downtown core and working with a lot of the downtown venues and businesses and the city itself we're very active in the conversations of how how Boise as a as a community um, grows in good ways and and is smart about managing that growth it's it's a challenge so and as far as the festival itself similar right so we we consciously don't pursue like really larger headliner types and stuff because we want to we want people to come to the festival for this sense of discovery and the experience itself and not be overly weighted toward just coming to see one artist. And granted that happens, but that would really change the dynamic of, of the community that comes to the festival. So we're pretty mindful about managing growth in that sense, right? Even if we could book somebody that might double our attendance size, that may not lead to positive outcomes. So, yeah. Yeah. And the city has a reputation. I don't know if, if you know, your lived experience is, is, is the same, but from the outside it has a reputation of really being pretty intentional about the importance of the creative economy of, you know, there's all the history with, with the Trey McIntyre project being based in Boise for quite some time. And um, can you speak to kind of, you know, this community in the middle of Idaho that also really values, again, creators and creatives and having a scene and, and really having a, a community and a culture? I mean, what is that dynamic like from the city and, and the business uh, side of things? Yeah, there was a pretty pivotal moment in the mid 80s, from my understanding, where, you know, there was an opportunity to put a mall in where downtown is now. And they they chose not to put a mall there and instead build a real truly like, to, you know, keep the downtown a very downtown centric. So there's really strong downtown community in the city and uh, the surrounding businesses really put a lot of energy into that. And so there is a thriving downtown scene, which is, uh, you know, being a mid-sized city isn't always the case all over the, uh, the uh, country. And so... There's that, and I think a lot of that then is there've been there's, you know, then also at the bottom of the recession, 2009, the city formed the the Boise Arts and History D Department, which at that time, city government was actually a pretty, I think, a pretty bold move when when uh, budgets were tight. There's a lot of room for improvement, I will say, but the city has been really great about supporting the arts. In fact, and you know, we were part of a cultural ambassador pro program that they put in place. We were the, I think. Was Trey McIntyre the one before us? It might have been, and then, and then us, and then, you know, so for three years, rock and roll essentially was the cultural ambassador of Boise, which I was impressed with our city to, to you know, be willing to go out on a limb like that and also recognize what we were bringing. 
I saw that Dio from Global Lounge is attending. Uh, Global Lounge was one of the more recent um, cultural ambassadors, and it's a great uh, non nonprofit here. So, yeah, the city's, you know, there's, I think, as a lot of the work that you do, my Michael Inter faces with policy, I think the city is pretty open minded and willing to collaborate with folks like us on being better. And I think they've done a good job, but there's room for improvement like anywhere. But the fact that they're willing partners is, is mm -hmm. what matters, right? And as we move towards reopening, how kind of what's the temperature in Boise? I mean, so so the announcement for Tree Fort is what are your fall dates? Your so, so our postponed 2020 festival, which we had to, for those that don't know, had to postpone it two weeks before it happened. We were on the front, the cresting wave of COVID. We we announced our postponement the morning later that day is when the NBA postponed and stuff. So for context, everybody knows that day. I think it was pretty. Um, so anyway, so we postponed initially to September 2020 it was really early on then we postponed all the way to september 2021 20, so those dates are september 22nd through 26th we are moving forward and getting the details of that we have an artist announcement coming this week that um uh, over 300 artists or most of which are just were already on the lineup or plan to come back and you know um a lot of the international travelers are moving to our march version of the festival so we're planning to do two Two full festivals in six months, which is a little a new challenge for our, our team because we will go back to our March dates because we like filling that hole here in town. Um, but you know, so we're going to be a little more local, regional. But there's a de 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 decent amount of national acts on it still, and um, and things are looking good. Vaccines are moving fast here, er, around here, and I think general reopening spirit is good. Things are reopen-ish, but there's a you know we're work, working with the health department in the city. It seems like the timeline is going to work well for for the fall, but at the same time, being the type of festival that we are, it's pretty easy. It, we're already a bunch of small events mm -hmm. happening at the same time, as opposed to one large event, really. And so, we being in the fall, the weather's a lot better here at that time frame. So we see the opportunity to move more out things outdoors, which we did these men outdoor shows last year and stuff. So we can re rebuild in order to fit the what we need to is our mindset on it. What is your typical mix of indoor versus outdoor? And Usually it's yeah, being in being in March and spring weather in Boise is usually like it, it'll be 72 degrees one day and snowing the uh, next. So we do have one outdoor main stage that runs you usually just runs four of the five days. And then then it's otherwise a series of at peak. There's about 30 indoor stages on Saturday night that we're using throughout the downtown core, a mix of established venues and um, em empty spaces or e event spaces. So so this year we we're going to probably do five days of main stage to, to make sure there's enough outdoor space and then look at potentially restaging some of the indoor things outside. But I will say being a big champion of our indoor venue friends, like I don't want to, we don't want to move away from them until we have to, because they've been dark for a year and a half, you know? So, so anyways, that's kind of our mindset too. We want to make sure to include them if we can, but being able to pivot as needed. So how are, how's your team you know, get into the nuts and bolts of the protocols and vaccine passports or all that stuff. I mean, so I know you're very active in NEVA and your your folks are definitely, you know, tied into that national network. What, where are you in that process in terms of like, like, are you still in the stage where you've got a, you're still building your punch list of things you've got to figure out or are you really thinking that you got it nailed or, yeah, what's that like in, at this stage? We have it nailed, no. Um, the, uh, so in, in, in all honesty, you know, we met with the city and central district health here and, you know, we, we have a general sense of the parameters we're working with, right? But as we all know, this stuff is just changing really quickly and, you know, they're not going to be able to fully approve a plan until we get closer anyhow. So I would say right now it's more like all options are on the table, but we're pretty clear on, you know, some general guidelines. Like we, like I said, like per, from a per event standpoint, we ran some COVID safe outdoor stuff last year. So we know if it's like full closer to lockdown, how to run a show like that. But as far as like other things like vaccine passports and stuff, probably not going to be, I mean, it's kind of a back pocket thing. Like, like if it's that or not do an event, I think that's like something we would consider. But I think, I think a, the conversation in the States most likely, I, I doubt there's going to be a lot of that happening. So um, I would say at this point, we're confident we can pull something off. We're just not sure the full makeup of it and exactly how to look. So this summer will be a little, a little bit more building the plan to work with, uh, you know, a little bit more knowns, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the early indications of from the city, are they enthusiastic about you moving forward with September? I mean, is that everybody? yeah, 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 yeah. And I, and that's same with the health department. I'm fairly confident, especially if we're willing to scale down if we have to. And 
you know, I, I think the baseline I've been operating under, if we have to be at 50% capacity at all spaces, we just have to create more capacity, you know, by creating more outdoor stages and stuff like that. And so we are going to limit, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of like single day passes or single show tickets people can potentially get. We're going to, at this point, plan on it maybe being a pass holder only sort of approach mm -hmm. so we can manage a smaller, a smaller attendance size. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I had another thought on that, but. Um, quick question in from, from Michael Seaman, and this is, I, I would, I think is an, a very odd question. He's, he's asking uh, if, if the lightning bolts are returning for 2021, Michael, the, the girls basketball team that I coached for seven years, we, we don't play anymore. The girls are too old, but we enjoyed uh, the lightning bolts. Oh no, he means the band. I'm sorry. Who's lightning bolt? Are they returning for 2021? Are you able to, uh, to say? Well, to, to give a gift to those that are attending this, yes, they're coming back. And I'm curious, um, because they're a very like uh, a very uh, physical show, like they're very you know. So if, if those that have seen them, so I'm you know, it's, it's <laughs> I'm glad Michael's excited. But it is shows like that. I'm kind of curious. You know, that's kind of thing we're all kind of wondering. You know, so those of us that like the style festival we do, and in general, one of the the, the, the joys of a festival like Treefort is it is seeing a lot of artists in more intimate spaces. And right now, intimate spaces is means a lot of people <laughs> are a lot closer right. to each other. So. That's going to be interesting. And, and just before we let you go, Eric, and, and thanks always for, you, for your time, I'd talk a little bit about Radio Boise and talk about community radio and, and your show and, and kind of what that has meant in the broader kind of music and cultural ecosystem in, in Boise. I'll just say, so I did college radio in, in a different, in a, up in North Idaho. And for the longest time as a touring act, act too, traveling around, Boise, Boise had a gap between the mid 80s and what ended up being 2011 with no independent or community radio or true college college radio. And it was a really profound gap in this community. And so when community radio, Radio Boise hit the air, actually we just hit our 10th uh, terrestrial broadcast anniversary on April 11th. Um, it was a big shift. There was all of a sudden like not, not only local acts but independent acts in general, the, the you know, it really, there's a lot of, from the community news stand, standpoint and other so it's a huge very important hub in this community and it made a profound difference i it's, i think it was it was easy to see because of the stark di di difference we all saw what it was like without it and now having it 10 years in and what a big difference it's made for the music community but also the broader creative community so one of the things that's so interesting and you know this is again part of my history is just working on on the whole kind of legalization of low power terrestrial community radio and the balance between having, you know, again, so, you know, we're all moving so aggressively to digital radio platforms and streaming and just what is the sort of balance in y'all's mind or when, when you're programming versus thinking about a, just a hyper local audience versus thinking about the global audience that you're reaching mm. you just your network of friends and, and, and kind of, you know, fans and, and colleagues, like what is, how do you approach that in your, in your programming? I think uh, me personally, I think all most of the D DJs are Radio Boise, which for those that don't know, a D station like ours is all volunteer. D D D DJ ran and each DJ has a lot of leeway about what they they uh, present. But I think we really think of it as locally focused. And if people are tuning into it, they're 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 seeing the local focus. And not that there's not like broader relevance to that, but that's how we face it. And there's a lot of terrestrial listeners. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Derek, I mean, excuse me, Eric, thank you as always for joining us and congratulations on the Treeport announcement. We're going to bring you back in a couple of months as, as things are getting super real and and uh, we appreciate all the work that you and all your colleagues are doing. So we'll, we'll bring you back or no, we'll bring you back uh, yeah, out to, uh, to Boise. Thank Eric, you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, we're going to shift our, our focus and, and spend the second half of our program um, talking to some leaders in, in the Albuquerque region, um, Albuquerque. If you haven't had a chance to be out to, to New Mexico, you really you, you need to do it. It's it's a beautiful part of the world. Um, some amazing organizations, some amaz amazing individuals, and um, we're going to bring our focus to Annie and Marisol from the National Institute for Flamenco. And Alex, if you don't mind running this uh, running this video, that would be great. Thank you.
Awesome. Awesome, awesome. So let me welcome in Annie and Mary Self from the National Institute for uh, Flamenco. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Michael. Thank you. Sorry, there I was getting- Hey, Mary Self, welcome. So tell us what we just saw there. You've got you know, some streaming events coming up this week, but let's talk a little bit about the Institute and, and uh, what, just, what we just saw in that preview clip. So what you saw in the preview clip is a little promo that we put together for a show that we had, that we did last weekend and also coming up this weekend. Uh, we have a professional company of artists. It consists of 20 dancers and musicians. Um, and they're in this, in this performance, they're performing in a tablao. So a tablao is a performance format it's kind of like a jazz club, but for flamenco. And it's been an important part of flamenco's history. In Spain, there are a number of tablaos in major cities. Um, they come from this idea of like singing cafes that were popular in the 20th century throughout Europe and France and different um, European cities. But in, in Spain, they tended to have music and uh, flamenco, Spanish music and flamenco. And so uh, tablao is, uh, again, it's a performance format where a lot of uh, collabor kind of collaboration, collective improvisation takes place. And so between the musicians and the dancers, and so what you saw there were, was a little promo of some people that are getting ready to perform in Tablao. And um, that was a kind of a dramatic, um, <laughs> a dramatic uh, promo of, of these performers. We also do uh, the company and the, our professional company in the Tablao is just one of the things that we do at the Institute, but it's an important part of what we do at the Institute. So I've, um, I was enormously fortunate to uh, attend a, a Tablao performance in Albuquerque at, at the Institute a number of years ago, and, and I just thought it was one of the most spectacular and moving evenings I, I can remember. I mean, just the music, the dance, the theater, just the emotion of it. I mean, it was just a spectacular evening. And and actually, let me bring in Hakeem Bellamy, Hakeem with the City of Albuquerque's Department of, of Arts and Culture and um, Music Policy Forum board member. And so when we were putting together this program, you know, this session, you know, kind of thinking about cultural institutions in, in, in the Albuquerque and the New Mexico region, you know, Hakeem, you really wanted these guests here at the table to kind of represent and talk a little bit about, you know, about the Institute and, and we're having some sound problems, unfortunately, with, with Derek. So I'm not sure we'll be able to bring him in to, to talk about what's happening to Gathering Nations. But could you speak to just kind of like these organizations and institutions as part of the cultural and artistic fabric in the Albuquerque region? I certainly can. And thank you. Thank you for having us, when I say us, thank you for having Albuquerque, but in Albuquerque center stage, no pun intended. Thanks Marisol uh, for, for talking about those stages. And you know, for flamenco, they have to be really sturdy stages. So uh, you mentioned you mentioned having seen uh, Tablao. Um, they are, it really is the experience of being transported. Like I, after you pick your jaw up off the table, you are like, like time passes. It's like being in a, a casino in Vegas. You could have been there for 10 minutes or 10 days. And then you walk out and you're like, wow, I like literally left. Like I left and, and went, you know, I went to Maine and back, like, you know, and, and it really is, um, especially once it becomes a fully immersive experience at the Tablao with the food and the drink and the art um, and the culture it really, yeah, it's, it's, it's a getaway without um, needing a passport, you know, in a plane. So I just want to throw that in there because that's when I got beamed into this, but, but really um, Michael and, and, and of course, shout out to the whole MPF our whole board and everybody that makes these 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 happen, um, but um, but yeah, just with having both gathering and National Institute of Flamenco as not like they're in they're, they're international events. They are international events. You know, the festival that the Institute of Flamenco puts on brings in in, in pre COVID times, right? Brings in artists from across the world. Um, gathering of Nations brings in other nations to our, to, you know, to this heart of Albuquerque. And what's interesting about both of them is that it is, they are uniquely culturally rich events. So yes, there is music and, and, and there is dance at both. And so, yeah, that, that, that makes it a, an arts event, 
But the cultural aspect is that, you know, it is cultural preservation in many cases. It is religious dance in many cases. It is historic preservation and heritage in many cases. And so it, it's, it, it's beyond a concert, right? It's beyond a musical performance in both, in bo at both Gathering of Nations and the National Institute of Flamenco. And, um, and it's, it's really a thing that it, it's, it's happening in Albuquerque. It, it, it could happen elsewhere. We're fortunate for both of these to happen in Albuquerque, but that it really brings the world to us and, and brings us to the world. And so when, when, when you asked me to think like who off the top of your head, they both immediately came to mind because yeah, and I think it's just, and that's what se separates Albuquerque and New Mexico in many ways from, from other parts of the country, you know, I'm, I'm being a little biased, uh, but, uh, but that we, 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 there is always that additional element of storytelling, of passing on, of, of preservation and not letting something die, frankly. And we talk a lot, you know, in, in our work and in, in, in this program about, you know, what, what we, I don't know if this is a, a, an appropriate term, but we talk a lot about a cultural continuity. We talk a lot about not taking culture and making it a museum piece or looking backwards, but also helping create the environment for the advancement of the work and, and of the art and of, of, of the culture. And I know in the Institute, a lot of your work is education focused, not only, you know, it's, it's youth focused, it's, you know, trying to, you know, create these gathering places again through the festival. I know, Annie, you've been working very hard during the shutdown. I mean, you all have, but now Annie in particular have been really working on how do you take, you know, the essence of the work in terms of community engagement and, and bringing people together and being a hub and how do you take that into a virtual space? I know you've been doing a lot of work, you know, kind of in terms of streaming events and you've got the festival be online. Could you speak a little bit about how you've been approaching that and what that's looked like in terms of the Institute's mission and, 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 and the ongoing work? Yeah, um, thank you. Of course, yeah, we've, it's definitely been a, a team, team effort for all of us here at the Institute and with Marisol at the helm, um, making a lot of our really like important decisions um, decisions about programming. So one of the things that we did last year for the first time ever was we took Festival Flamenco online. And that was, um, last year was the festival's 33rd year. Uh, so, so it was uh, really crucial that we made it as excellent as possible. And it was a big learning curve, you know, because we were learning the technology right away. So uh, we were fortunate to have many artists here in New Mexico and many artists in Spain who produced special works for the festival. And uh, we worked very closely with our videographer, who is also a filmmaker, Chris Royval, to edit those together and provide them during the festival. Now, of course, live streaming is a, is a different animal than, than doing that. And so our classes have been live the whole time. Um, during this time of COVID, our conservatory classes have been live through Zoom. Our festival workshops were live through Zoom. And now with our professional company, Hasbros, we are doing these live stream fadlas as well. So it's a lot of um, experimentation and perspiration. And then also like, we're very fortunate, I think, in, um, in our community to have uh, access to some really excellent musicians and some people who really understand um, understand sound and how things need to sound. And so having their expertise is, is really invaluable. And what does reopening look like for y'all? What, what kind of timelines are you on in, in terms of in-person events? I mean, are you, do you, I mean, do you see a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of getting back to kind of a new normal or is it just one day at a time and, and just kind of figure out as, as, as things move on in this process? I guess I'll take that question <laughs> since I am. Um, well, you know, reopening looks like uh, we, we kind of considered that we didn't ever really close in the pandemic because we tried to pivot right away and do Although, I mean, you definitely missed the energy of being able to do things live, but we had to, um, for kind of just perseverance and sustainability, we had to pivot and figure out ways to be able to continue to program. So um, I will say that um, staying open in, in the pandemic was pretty brutal, um, you know, <laughs> continuing to program in that. 
is uh, is tiring definitely, and you know sometimes it's it's hard to get the same kind of rush that you get from live performance or live out of something that is uh, virtual. So that's I say that because sometimes you don't get the you don't get what you need to be filled with to be able to continue <laughs> to program to do it. Um, but so our first like in person, we're working towards trying to do some in person in July for a festival that we're doing, but we small scale. Uh, usually our, our international festival that we do in the summer is um, a very large event. We're cutting it back by about half this year. We're bringing in some international artists though who will be coming to perform and teach. And um, I just really quickly wanna give a shout out to Derek uh, with a uh, gathering of nations. We've collaborated on different things together and the gathering the powwow that we have here in Albuquerque is just outrageous and if you have an opportunity to come and see it sometime you really you can't miss it we, we go every year and we did a collaborative thing where we were able to uh, collaborate with some um, local drummers Native American drummers here and we were able to dance with them and I want to just say that too that what makes I think the flamenco seen in Albuquerque special is that we're native New Mexicans and who have been built, uh, building a kind of a, a community of flamenco artists uh, who are through view flamenco through the really culturally hybrid identity and way and it's part of our life and it's a way through where we identify and and express ourselves artistically without being um, Spanish per se with a Spanish passport. We're New Mexicans and it's part of, it's our artistic vehicle. So I think that, you know, we do have a really large community of very skilled artists. We're lucky to have that, but we also have all of these different um, ideas and, and experiences that we draw inspiration from. And some of that is from the work of, of our brothers at the Gathering of Nations and all of the artists and people that live within our community in New Mexico, which is really beautiful. And so I don't know if I answered your question, Michael. No, that's but, great. That, that's great. And Derek, you want to try again and see if we got your, your mic working? Anything? Yes. Hey, all right. Awesome. Good. Awesome. Thank you for, for sticking with it. So that's a, a great, you know, kind of, of segue and connection point to just the, the notion of you know, I guess one way I would think about it is that so often in, in music, we think about competition, we think about making money and, and just sort of who's the winner and who's on the charts and who's playing the big shows. And, and we lose, you know, the essential humanity of, of music and art, which is about humanity and about people. And it's great, Marisol, to hear just the, you know, notion of the, of the community coming together and all these different collaborations. And Derek, you've got a big virtual festival coming up next week, right? Uh, we start a week from today. Yeah, um, it's this is our second year. And when I heard Jesse earlier talking about when they shut down, that was the same day we got shut down by the governor. And that was about 10, 30, 11 in the morning. And after that, everything began to roll. All powers across the United States and Canada. They they were all watching from Facebook Live because Channel 7 shot it out there and immediately everything went down. And what was really something was, and we knew Gathering of Nations had a tremendous effect on the local economy, but we had no idea until we heard from people. And we were hearing from the hotel industry that said that it was like the air came straight out of the balloon. It was the immediate, the word that we were gone, the spring for Albuquerque was over. And that was pretty incredible. But what was really something was, was the impact it had on us because like Jesse said, and he was in a little bit more of a ready to go because they were later in March. We still had about four or five weeks, but yet and still gathering is so big. It's, it's phenomenal. So we had everything locked and it was just a matter of pulling the trigger and going. So we lost a lot of money in the standpoint of advertising that couldn't be returned. We've got a big local magazine here called Albuquerque, the magazine. And the day we got shut down, one of the first things I did was to call and cancel the ad and said, guess what? We just went to press. Yeah. So, and it was that way. We lost a sound company here that was phenomenal. It's been, it's kind of like trying to stay on the stepping stones and don't fall in the water along the way. Um, but one of the things that's been really uh, 
heartfelt for us was we first had to get our heads around surviving how we were going to do that when we didn't quite know what this was. It wasn't like a blue fog coming. All it was, was this thing coming. So it was really that shock. And we didn't have a lot of time to think about it. And people said, what are you going to do this, that, and the other? We had obligations to vendors. We had obligations to ticket holders. And that kind of an expense was way more than anything at the moment before an event that you have hanging out in the bank, ready to, it all went into getting ready and by it being the type of event that it is the gathering of nations and everyone's talked about its size let me give you an idea for what that is uh on the inside it's three thousand or better singers and dancers performing inside in traditional outfits and so forth humongous uh trade fair with about 400 vendors um a contemporary stage we call stage 49 and there's about 25 to 35 performers there. And outside, it attracts, oh, about on average, nearly 80,000 people a year for a two and a half day event. And they're international, as they were saying, they come from all over the world, all tribes. And there's really no way to know who's coming until they arrive because it's the kind of event that it is. And it's pretty much still a cash economy. So we've, we don't get a lot of reservations for things. So it's, it's been a lot of that and it really, it, it drew on the creativity and the responsibility. We had a big responsibility to Indian country. Uh, gathering has been said to be the Mecca of, of uh, Indian country. And we had a practice the other night for the Saturday, which is going, the next Saturday is gonna be absolutely live. Uh, live dancers, live singers, the whole bit as best we can. And we had a practice the other night and there were so many people in our practice that hadn't seen each other in nearly two years that it was a, a weird thing to have a homecoming a reunion of such online. Yeah. And we were hearing from people and hearing the, the pain and hearing their need. And one of the needs was to, as they called it, to migrate back to Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. And it's just been our responsibility and we led through the summer thanks to Hakeem and his crew for pitching in and giving us a few bucks to get going. We luckily have a radio station on iHeart Radio and we programmed it and we went straight through the summer and into the fall with a very special program, particularly to Indian country and anybody else in the world that was listening, uplifting spirit, uh, giving them hope, giving them the, the thought that we might get out of this and reminding them what it takes to get in and out of this. And then we did the same thing weekly with uh, rewind videos from as far back as 1984 of old gathering of nations, powwows and dancers. And again, that same theme perpetuated through the entire thing, got into a couple of Zoom dance parties, a Halloween party and a pre New Year's Eve party. And those were again, just to lift that spirit. And those turned out to be really incredible. You know, we've got a lot of people that talk about the um, first responders and the heroes as doctors and whomever's out there, the scientists and the people in the grocery stores and wherever they may be. Well, we didn't have, we're not that, but what we are is sort of like the spirit keepers. And so we were able to do what we could and just try and reach deeper inside, not giving orders to people that so harsh and everything, but just reminding them of where we were and where we want to get back to what that feeling is. And it turned out to be, a rocky start, but after after a little bit and people understood where we were and what we were doing, it was well received. Um, comments coming in from Australia and New Zealand and so many different places that thanking us for the spirit. They didn't understand it, but thank you for bringing that to them. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of it. And for the last 38 years, we're completely self-taught mm -hmm. and we're self-taught through. We understood the powwows. We understood the smaller powwows. We are lovers of live music. We attend a lot of live music and I've applied everything in my life from education and social abilities and different things to making Gathering of Nations what it is. And so when you guys first asked me to come on, you said, tell us a little bit about what have you learned? So I've been turning that around yeah. and I, 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 this is about the third or fourth of these that I've done. And they asked that same question. And each time that question is asked, 
the response, I think, gets a little bit deeper because on the surface, say, what did you learn? Well, first I says, well, we learned how to operate the Zoom. But that's that's basic. That's That was pretty basic. The thing next to that was understanding the responsibility, understanding the heartfelt pain of the people that really need to hear music and, and their cultures and that sort. Uh, from my perspective, musicians are all very special people. They carry a, they're our spirit. They bring something to us. Well, the sound of those drums uh, have been known to actually, they're healing sources. And I, if we had enough time, I could tell you many, many, many healing stories, including with my wife, Lita, who uh, 11 years ago had a, a liver transplant. And our uh, medicine man, our social spiritual healer, he doctored with her first before the Mayo Clinic um, went in to take care of business. But he followed us all the way to Phoenix. He met with the doctors. He was there during surgery, not in surgery, but there. And the doctor came out from that and said, um, I had each one of these that I do is a miracle, but this was a miracle of miracles. That liver started on its own. I had to do little to make it happen. And to this day, thankfully, she's had very little uh, trouble with it. And her blog is on our website and so on. And we've been working at Gathering of Nations as a community uh, organization, community event. And we think of community as perhaps like a small town or a few blocks in a city. Our community is from the West Coast to the East Coast, from North borders to South borders and so on. And it's really something when you think about how many people attend the Gathering of Nations and out of that number, we probably know or have met or remember 75% of that group, which is a phenomenal number of people. And it's a family event. They come at, uh, from, they learn to dance when they learn to walk, as they say. And so there's, it, they come from all ages and all places. And for a lot of people, this is a, a bucket list, one-time destination for so many. And our responsibility, be it pandemic, be it when we get back together, be it before pandemic, is pretty much the same, how we deliver the message. What do we present to people that gives them that good feeling and something that's going to last. And we use the gathering for a lot of teaching skills as well, teaching opportunities bringing other musicians in that may or not from that are non-native that we bring them in, like working with the Flamenco project to bring them to stage and show off and showcase that and the similarities in cultures. And we've brought in contemporary musicians um, from as far back as Rita Coolidge to O'Teal Burbridge just a couple of years ago. And it's amazing how receptive it all is because we give opp opportunities to people that they may have never had before. And Indian country and the native culture is far, far off of mainstream. And at the same time, it is very important for native musicians, native people, anybody and everybody to at least understand that dominant society, how it works. We, we're at a point in time where we can't avoid it. Uh, it it's impossible. And musicians are, our native musicians believe they're all rock stars before they even get going. And one of the things we try to do is to give them that opportunity to be that rock star and hopefully bring the experience forward that they get enough exposure, they develop a fan base, and hopefully some of the uh, folks from the bigger world hear them and wonder, understand how good that music is. So gathering is all encompassing of a lot of different things. This year, our Friday, which is next Friday, the 23rd, starting at noon, as if it was the powwow here in Albuquerque, our regular start time. But that day is again going to be a lot of video rewinds, highlights of the best years, very special contests that we don't provide, but they were provided by the people that sometimes they come. They'll, uh, we select them as a head dancer or something like that. And they, in the native tradition, they then honor the, the honoring and by giving back and they do these contests and massive giveaways and things. We've edited down quite a few of those that we thought were really phenomenal in different categories. And that along with lots of interviews from great people and that part's hosted by um, a host from Native America Calling, which is a radio show that's nationwide. So they're gonna be involved. And at the end of that, we're going to rewind one of our concerts that is the Nth Power with NRG Rising from New Zealand. 
Emmett Skimmy Garcia with Native Roots from here in Albuquerque and Oteil Burbridge and DJ Logic all on stage at the same time. That's what I'm talking about. We give locals the experience of stepping on stage with some of the big guys. Yeah. And then we move into the dance parties and then just kind of finish the night. The next day is all live starting at noon and we go through the same process again. Well, I just, you know, I love this so much. And, and you know, I love the, the kind of continuity that you notice between, you know, the, the stuff in Boise and Tree Ford and the stuff happening at the Tableau and, and, and the work that you're doing. And, you know, we, we talk a lot in this program about, you know, we, we don't, you know, when, whatever restarting and, and, and getting back to the new normal looks like, it, it, it's not about just getting back to, you know, December of 2019. We, we have to use this break to think about how do we value our, our culture? How do we put resources towards it? Um, what does it mean again in terms of our humanity? I, I think, you know, Derek, to build on something you're saying, you know, we, we've all, you know, had to confront the fact that in times of crisis and in times of, of anxiety and stress and fear, we very naturally turn towards our musicians and our dancers and art to help us process and 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 that has not been available you know in, in the traditional ways that we've you know, are used to throughout history of engaging with it and, and that's really you know exacerbated the problem and and then we turn to sort of policy questions broadband deployment uh, in indian country is a scandal yeah and doesn't exist we're thankful that you know the Biden administration has named it as a scandal, and, and they're going to work to put resources and technology and to deploy it because you know we all have seen leaders like you and you know and Annie and Marisol and others are are adapting on the fly to try to take these programs and make them available through these other technology platforms, which are amazing if you are blessed to have the economic power to have the technology and to right. pay for technology, and a lot of people have not had that opportunity, so. We've got some really important things that, that I think we all are taking away from this experience, um, you know, and, and, and whether it's simply, you know, and this is trite to say, but, you know, simply valuing and, and holding up the things that we lost, you know, during this, this shutdown and, and, and being better, you know, caretakers, particularly when we think about, you know, it, 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 it you know, I, I'm, I'm always bothered when we put everything into an economic impact lens, but we have to recognize that, that there is a, whether it's an economic impact, whether it's a public health impact, whether it's, a, you know, all the things that, that these events bring, you know, we, we, we have to make sure that they're resourced and, the, and that they're, they're protected and, and taken care of um, and supported in whatever ways that that means. And, you know, Hakeem, I know just bringing you back in as we move towards, towards closing, and I know the city is engaging you know, creatively and also at the state level. I mean, everybody's really thinking about what does that mean in practice? You know, not lip service and, you know, and just saying nice things, but what does that mean in terms of dollars or policy or other things that, that the public sector can do? I don't know if you can speak any more to kind of what you're all thinking about in your department on, on you know, kind of as we move towards reopening and, and towards what the next normal is gonna look like. Sure, sure, thanks for asking and, and definitely thank you I feel like also picking Derek and Mary Soul was also saying, how do we put our best foot forward and really show the world, well, you know, how we do things differently. And I think Mary Soul spoke to that, like yeah. the idea that um, that art is cultural transmission, but really, um, you know, it, the art the art is a vehicle for our stories, right? And so that kind of um, hybridization that happens here, um, Mary Soul is particularly talking about the flamenco tradition here, germane to New Mexico and how we build community around that, how we put our values and mores and overlay it on top of and underneath, right? And then that's how we also share our culture and are in conversation with these other traditions from around the world. Same thing with gathering of nations. Like we always, we have, we have to put our flavor on it. He mentioned a, a good friend of mine, Emmett Shkemi Garcia, who I know from storytelling days and like, you know, Native Roots has this Native American approach to reggae that has won them Grammys, like you know, and so it's like yeah, we 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 make it our own, right? And and I and I'm I'm thankful to both National Institute of Flamenco and Gathering of Nations that they provide a canvas for that. Like Derek Derek spoke much to it about how we kind of groom talent, but really giving them the space to say, yeah, we'll put you on a big stage, but you still you gotta you gotta make it yours. Like you got put you in it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, right, like put you in it, right? Um, uh, but, um, and, and, I've, and and the other reason for picking both NIF and Gathering of Nations, 
Derek also spoke to, which answers your question, Michael, is that we realized really early on in the pandemic that there were gonna be some casualties of the pandemic in all sectors. When you're trying to prop up an ecosystem to weather a storm, there are decisions that you have to make, which are not fun decisions over what are the anchors of that ecosystem that you can't afford to lose. Mm -hmm. These are two of those organizations, right? You're like, you know, we, we, like if, we can, if we can help them weather the storm, if the government can help them weather the storm, then because we need them to be there on the other side, what, do we, what can we do to support that? And I think with both, I think Marisol came to us. I think Derek was kind of already doing his thing, but they were both like, look, we, we, a loss is a loss. We're not gonna have our festivals the way we normally have them, but the content is still important to get out there. And we're willing to do that as a service to the community how can you help us, right? <laughs> like, you know, yeah. and we were like, oh, th so th it was like, great. They are one of the anchors that we need to preserve. They're already moving towards an innovation, which is that kind of on the fly, having to really put everything, uh, make everything available online. You know, that's already got momentum. So that actually helps the government and the city to say, well, they're like, that's way, a little nudge will help them go way further than having to push something that's standing, that, that mm -hmm. you know, that, standing with no wheels even, right? And so really it was their innovation that made it easy for the city to support and then have those the taxpayers with dollars go further because they were already moving in that direction and they were already really, really innovating. And so all that to say, how, what does it look like on the other side? We're already looking at ways to invite presenters and content creators and performance uh, performers to our spaces. So we also know that the bar and venue industry got hit pretty bad too. So there's less of those places for people to play. And we, but we have an amphitheater at the museum and we're trying to figure out how to better staff that. So it's not museum staff, you know, it might mean bringing in a contractor to make sure that that, that place can light up, you know, maybe every weekend, right? You know, um, we, we haven't, because of our public health order, haven't yet opened our theaters. So the historic chemo theater, not yet open for business, South Broadway Cultural Center either, our, our smaller theater house. But the idea too is that once we do get the green light on that, or if you're watching outside of New Mexico, our, our color scale doesn't go to purple, it actually goes to turquoise because New Mexico. And so when we get it to like green and turquoise, <coughs> um, then we, get, we can really open those spaces up and make them available to producers and representing organizations at little to no cost, just because we don't need to make a profit. We actually need them to be, to be doing what they do and bringing the art to the, to the community, so. Well, Hakeem, I, I appreciate that as always, and, and we're, we're past time, so we need to close the program today, and, and I just want to give, a, again, a huge shout out and uh, the thanks and appreciation to Derek, Marcel, Annie, Eric for, for joining us today and, and sharing their experience and insight. Um, Alex Dolvin did a great job, as always, producing uh, the program. And uh, I think uh, Alex will not be with us next week. I think Alex has, has to run, a, run the Amplify conference. So we're gonna have an adventure without Alex, it'll be fun. Uh, but as always, um, thanks everybody for attending and your great questions and comments in the chat. If you have feedback, um, questions, ideas, suggestions, uh, kindly worded constructive criticism, you can always hit us at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, have a great rest of your Friday and a safe weekend, and we'll see you next week. Thanks again, everybody.